The person I'm going to introduce you right now is Dr. Scott Richard, who, you know, when we do these operations, we look at uh, me doing the upper wrap part of the abdomen and Dr. Richard doing the lower part of the abdomen. This is all work that uh, Dennis Chee really promoted when he we're over at Memorial Sloan Kettering, how to optimize outcomes by sharing the operative responsibility. And it's a privilege for me to, to uh, uh, present Dr. Richards today. He's been with me uh, doing these operations for really over the, over the past six or seven years. He's over at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, and he makes it over here to do these procedures with me. You know, he is a, uh, he's superbly trained, G1 oncologist and, you know, extraordinaire. Um, and he trained at UPMC, we recruited him here, and then, of course, when you are the Michael Jordan of G1 Oncology in this area, in my opinion, no pressure uh, there, Scott, um, no. everybody wants to recruit you. So maybe the big bucks drew you over there, but he, he, luckily he comes over to, to help us out over here at Drexel Hahnemann. Um, again, I want to thank Scott for being here. He always gives a great talk, and most importantly, he's a fantastic colleague, and if you're going to build a program, you want to patients you want to be treated at an institution where you, you got to go to a place where you have a great multidisciplinary team and and I Scott thank you very much for being here and uh, look forward to your talk I appreciate that thank you already already started with going great so I appreciate that dr. Bowne. it's it's truly an honor to be here um, I've been able to take part in the previous two symposiums so it's excellent to be able to keep this going and be here for the third one um, and, you know, coming across the street to work with Dr. Bound is an honor and a pleasure, so I really appreciate it. So before we start, I have nothing to disclose in relation to finances for this, but I do have to let everyone know that I, I hate cancer. I hate cancer a lot. And for those of you who have been affected like I have in your family with cancer, our hope is that we can do better as we go forward from here. So when Dr. Bound called me and said, you know, listen, I want you to present building a multidisciplinary team, I thought to myself, okay, so... It's kind of a difficult task to talk about because you know, we've had a really good thing going here um, for, like Dr. Bounce said, for about seven years. I know that Dr. Esquivel and Dr. Sugarbaker at their programs, you know, they've been able to be, surround themselves by some really strong people. So you know, I thought about it, like, so what does it take to build a team, right? And I think like when you really look at it, if you want to have a successful team, you have to start with one star person, someone that can be at the center with which you can build everyone else. And so. When I was looking for an example of that, you know, here in Philadelphia, we got our $330 million man, right? And so, you know, we, you, you know, he toyed with us to the very end, but we were able to get him and be successful here. Well, here at uh, Drexel University Hospital, this is our $330 million man. And, you know, then we have Dr. Esquel down here at his center. He's there. So he's the Manny Machado at his center, all right? And of course, we got to talk to Sugar Baker. He's the Mike Trout, you know, the one everyone covets and everyone wants, but he stays where he is. So we really appreciate the fact that we have people like this that we can build successful programs on. But when you go from there, it's not enough to have a star, right? You know, Manny Machado, Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, they can't win it by themselves. Like, Bryce Harper is an excellent man, but he can't play all nine positions. He'll try, all right? And if you paid him a little bit more, maybe you'd be able to do it. But he can only do so much. He can't pitch and catch in the outfield. And so you have to do some other people. You have to have supporting members that complement the star and what they can do. And so the Phillies, they have all these other people, these starting pitchers and relieving pitchers, their first and second baseman, their third baseman, people that surround Bryce and make him a uh, allow him to do what he wants to do. And here at, you know, at Drexel, we have... You know, our medical oncologists who have been supportive, and Renee Rubin is one of our medical oncologists. We have our anesthesiologists who we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, and Dr. Zebrows, one of the medical directors of anesthesia, a great example of how you have to have commitment and buy-in of other people and some quality people around you. We've got our urologists that Dr. Bound works with, uh, you know, a day in and day out. Preoperatively, they put the stents in for the pelvic dissection to make sure that we stay out of trouble. And when we do get into trouble and we, you know, get into the bladder or have to remove a portion of the bladder, they come in and assist us in repairing that. We have our perfusionists who are ready and able to come in and help us out when it's time to give uh, chemotherapy. And then finally, we have our nurses, the backbone really of the operating room, those that make it successful, both preoperatively, perioperatively, and intraoperatively to make sure that we can do what we do every day in and out. 
And so I think really when you look at it, success is a team effort. It's not an individual thing. We need to do something to make it successful. And it really starts at the beginning with medical oncology and it works all the way through to our perioperative and interoperative nursing. But what you have to avoid are distractions, okay? And for the Phillies, that distraction is the Philly fanatic. And here at Drexel, I'm the, that distraction, right? And so they bring me in every once in a while for comedic relief, just like they do the fanatic, all right? So when I looked at you know, this task and kind of started to think about it a little bit more, you know, I really kind of thought about what makes it successful for us to have a program, okay? And it's really, when you think about it, medical oncology. Because without a good medical oncologist, really the access to patients is severely hindered, right? Hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy has been around for, you know, almost 20 plus years now. It's been shown in multiple different studies to be successful for appendiceal tumors, colorectal tumors. There's now a large study that was uh, published about ovarian cancer for neoadjuvant ovarian cancer patients receiving hyperthermic chemotherapy. We know that it's beneficial and patients can benefit from it that have uh, intraperitoneal spread of their disease. But the problem becomes is that if you don't have the buy-in of the medical oncologists who are in the communities who are seeing these patients, who are having them referred from the family medicine doctors and the internal medicine doctors to come to see Dr. Bound for evaluation, then really your program kind of suffers from it. And I really think that it's almost as affected by that not having medical oncologists that buy into needing to get patients in, as is the lack of dedicated HIPEC centers in this country. We know that we don't have a lot of HIPEC centers in this country. We're getting more each year, and hopefully more and more high volume ones, but I think you know, access from the medical oncology community is the biggest aspect for us. And when I looked at it, I kind of looked at this number right here. So I pulled these, these numbers together, right? And when you look at it, you know, the 153,000 colorectal cancers that are diagnosed, or are expected to be diagnosed in 2019 in the United States. And if you look at it, about 17% are thought to have peritoneal metastasis. Almost 26,000 men and women then would have disease that potentially would benefit from what Dr. Escoval, Dr. Sugarbaker, and Bound do every day. Appendiceal, whoops, sorry. Appendiceal cancers is about 3,600 people a year diagnosed with appendiceal cancers, 40% intraperitoneal spread. So about 1,440 men and women. Gastric cancers, probably about 5,500. For ovarian cancer, we know about 60% of patients have intraperitoneal spread. That's about 13,000 women a year. And peritoneal mesothelioma, every single one of those patients, 600, have intraperitoneal spread and potentially would benefit from it. And this is basically what we're looking at, right? And so for those of you who are patients or loved ones for patients, when Dr. Sugarbaker or Dr. Escoval or Dr. Bound put a laparoscope into a patient, and they're looking to see if they see intraperitoneal spread, this is what they find, all right? You see diffuse disease all throughout uh, the lining of the abdomen. Down here on the omentum, there's disease up above the liver on the diaphragm. And this is what these gentlemen specialize in, in being able to get out and being successful when they do the complete cytoreductive surgery and then the HIPAC afterwards. But this is a, um, a paper that recently looked at it. And these are some of the high-performing centers here in the United States, Washington Cancer Institute, Wake Forest, University of Pittsburgh, where I was able to work with Dave Bartlett and his group, MD Anderson Cancer Center. You can see these are the number of cases that they've done over their volume um, for what they've reported in their studies. And this is what their expected annual volume is. And you can see, like, if you look at the four highest performing centers in the United States, and when you go back to that chart I showed before, where there was roughly probably about 35,000 individuals on that chart that would benefit from access to high-pack therapy, you can see that that's nowhere near that number. <clears throat> now, Sugar ba Dr. Sugarbaker and Dr. Escal and Dr. Bound are excellent people, and Bartlett and his group at UPMC are excellent women and men who do this day in and day out. But if they don't have access to the patients, they can't these patients potentially can't benefit from that. Now, not every woman or man that has intraperitoneal spread will potentially benefit from CRS and HIPEC, but I think access to it is really a big issue. And so when I look at building a team, we need to really get our medical oncologists on board. There are promoters, there are starters, there are the people that sell our tickets and get patients in to see us, and so we really have to kind of work with them. I think anesthesia is a really another big aspect of how it's going to be able to us build a very successful team. And anesthesia for complete cytoreductive surgery and HIPAC is not the same as, you know, my endometrial cancer surgery that I'll do. It lasts about two hours, and very little fluid shifts, and, you know, we give a little bit of fluid into it. It's a much more complex kind of thing. You know, restricted fluid management has been shown in a lot of institutions to be very beneficial 
particularly as far as uh, perioperative complications for these patients. And it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes for uh, our anesthesia colleagues because these are big open cases that last 14 hours. And traditionally in the past, one of the thought process were to just dump fluid into these women and men during the course of this case. We know that's exactly the wrong thing to do for a lot of these people. So you have to have anesthesia providers that understand this and look at it from a day in to day basis. Direct their therapy to what's going on in the operating room. Communicate with the providers that are doing it. And Dr. Bound, you know, has really, you know, been able to work with two or three really good anesthesiologists out of, you know, the 20 something anesthesia providers that we have here at Drexel and Hahnemann, and they really kind of focus in it. And so if they're not available, there are some very talented women and men that can come in. But having the same two or three people that do this every time he goes in the operating room is, you know, it allows them to know what he wants, what he anticipates. I think it's a very beneficial thing. Obviously, you know, the anesthesia, what they do every day, monitoring the core temp and monitoring the urine output are important things. And I, you know, like I said, I think communication with the surgical team is the most important thing. We work at a training center here at Drexel. So we may have a CRNA, we may have an anesthesia resident that's in there, but you know, their attending physician communicating with us and with their, their junior provider, their junior colleagues are very important things. And so there's, I pulled these graphs from a study that was done in 2014. And if you can look at the operative time of the case and what would happen from a respiratory assistance afterwards, blood loss during the case, operation duration, anesthesia time, all these things are, are factors that we know that the longer that they go, potentially could affect what we're doing postoperatively for patient care. So having an anesthesia provider that understands this and is able to help take part and communicate with us, I think it's a very important thing. I think nursing is really the backbone of a surgical team and what we do perioperatively. Um, you know, the preoperative nurses and, and the nurses that communicate with the patients about what to expect on the day of surgery, them having an understanding of what the complexity of our cases are going to be is very, very important. I think interoperatively, it's probably just as important or more important. And to have a group of women and men that see, work with us day in and day out and know what the needs and the anticipations for the surgeons are in the operating room are very successful. There's a paper that was done by a G1 oncology colleague of mine from the University of Virginia. And she looked at if there was one change of a surgical tech during the time of an operation, it increased the complexity or the risk of a complication afterwards by about 20%, right? And those cases averaged about three and a half hours in length, right? Dr. Bound's surgery is average on, on average about anywhere from 10 to 14 hours, okay? You can't have a, the same tech in there the entire time. She has to rotate in and out. But if you have, you know, a, a tech or a few techs that understand what's going on during the course of the case, hopefully we can decrease some of these complications and problems. Additionally, I think that the, uh, the circulating nurse is very important. She can anticipate the needs of the surgeon, and what the surgeon's gonna have to have and have that available because there's all this lost time if you have to leave the operating room to go get an instrument or something that the surgeon's gonna need. If all that's available and ready in the room, it helps out significantly. <clears throat> and I think you know, the most important thing at the end of the day is gonna be the surgeon and the training of the surgeon. Um, you know, there are a few centers in this country that have dedicated surgeons and dedicated surgical oncologists that train in hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, but they're few and far between. You know, there are a lot of surgeons now that are trying to establish themselves as being a high-pec center. I think that, you know, looking at what the training of the surgeon is going to be a very important thing because experience matters and volume matters. If you do one or two high-pec cases a year, I'm not sure that that's someone that I would want to send my wife or my loved ones to. Um, and I think it's the same in any field that you look at. Like, you know, if a patient comes into me and says, have you ever done this procedure before? And I look them in the face and say, no. Guarantee that they're going to see my friend out in Abington, Dr. Shaheen, is going to say, yeah, I do do this all the time, and I'm going to take care of you. Because there are people like that. And again, I would want that for my loved one, and I think people should experience that. So there are some associations of patient volume and improved outcome that really kind of, you know, kind of go to that. We do the practice makes perfect, and increased volume can lead to more proficient surgeons and surgery. I think that you're better able to rescue patients if there's some complications postoperatively and having a center that's done a lot of these, who has an ICU that understands what's gonna go on postoperatively with the patients is very beneficial. We can implant processes to improve outcomes for patients because you're gonna have more aspects. You're gonna see what worked before. What do we need to do differently with future cases? Um, better teams lead to better systems of care, I think, that there are more aspects of what's going on 
And ultimately, the more experience you have, the more errors. I think Oscar Wilde famously once said, is that experience is what someone call, what another person would call their mistakes, okay? And I think that that's really what it goes to. Like, the more that you do and the more that you see, whether it's in the ICU or interoperatively, the better you are going to be able to take care of problems. So strategies, I think, to improve uh, outcomes are to establish training programs and mentorships throughout the country and kind of work with teams that work better. See what's worked with Dr. Sugarbaker and Dr. Esquivel and mimic that and bring that on. And an additional thing would be to go to their centers and see them in action, right? To see Dr. Sugarbaker and Dr. Esquivel work is like watching Michael Jordan play basketball or LeBron James play basketball. It's a thing of beauty, right? And so if you can go there and see how they work and pick their brains over a cup of coffee afterwards or while they're operating about what have they done, what's their experience, how have they made this work, and then maybe if you can convince them to come to your institution and, and work with you to get a little bit better, that would help out a lot. I think one of the things is really to, you know, like I said before, out of the 33,000 people that were on that list that may benefit from HIPEC chemotherapy, selecting the right patient is an important thing and knowing how to do that and not just taking every person that comes in the door because we know that these are difficult surgeries and it may be that there are some complications and problems that those women and men don't necessarily need to have. And I think one of the things that we're really looking at in G1 oncology that maybe surgical oncology and HIPEC should look at is looking at what qualifies you as an experienced surgeon, right? If you do two surgeries a year, is that an experienced surgeon? Is 20 surgeries a year an experienced surgeon? What's that cutoff? Like, where do you put that bar, that, that bar and what do you have to go over to be able to consider yourself as a high volume center with a lot of experience? I think, you know, they talk a lot of time about creating checklists and, and one of these things is they look at the airline industry and pilots have these checklists that they need to do before they take off before they can land, if there's a problem in our, in, during the flight, they pull their checklist out. Maybe we should have those sort of things here. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important is that the more that we do, the more data that we can collect, the more data that we can report, and the more outcomes that we'll be able to look at for these patients. So these are the things that we do and take care of all day, and so this is why a team's really important. Now, you know, if I'm a surgeon and I look at this, you know, my friend Mark Shaheen and I were trained to kind of look at this from an ovarian cancer standpoint and say, all right, this is something that we potentially could be able to do. But you know, the beauty about working with a team is that you know you're never alone, right? And so when I was here at Hahnemann, I knew that my friend Dr. Bowen was three hours down, right? And so if I ran into this and I, I thought I needed a, you know, a question about what I needed to do or an extra set of hands to help me out that's more qualified than one of my residents, my team mate can come in and help me dissect that. Or in this case, the same kind of thing. I mean, you can see this diffuse mesenteric disease, disease all throughout the pelvis. Is this something that I should try to accomplish on my own or should I bring a team in, right? And so we you know here at Drexel, all right, we have what we refer to as the dragon approach to colorectal, uh, complete recital reductive surgery in HIPAC, all right? And Dr. Bounds' new nickname after this should be the dragon, okay? Really for Drexel University. Uh, you can call him the dragon if you want to from now on. I think it's a good nickname for him, right? And so what he really looked at is that, you know, when he was building the HIPEC team, he actually started it before I came here. And one, he was actually one of the reasons why I actually left Pittsburgh to come to Hahnemann originally was the ability to work with someone of his talents. It was like, you want to kind of start building people that are going to work really well with you. Have a core group of attending anesthesia providers that understand what you're doing and how to go through. And really, as I said, we have two or three people that we work with here at Drexel on a routine basis. He has a small group of nurses that are part of the team. They come in and out. They're actually, you know, because to work with the dragon is like to work with the master. So a lot of these women, they say, apparently there's a line about five deep in order to come onto his team. So having those people and be able to work with it. We have a couple of perfusionists we work with on a regular basis, as well as urologists who know the complexity of this case and what we need to do. And so out of the 20 urologists that are on staff at Drexel, two of them are the ones that are involved in the cases of Dr. Bound because they understand what he needs and what he wants to do, and they communicate on a regular basis about that. You know, the dragon is our only surgical oncologist here, but you know, he's aggressive. I'm really trying to make that nickname stack, okay, so. All right. so, uh, so, you know, he's the one, he's dedicated, he has a very, uh, you know, excellent skill set. He is a high volume surgeon when it comes to doing these. Um, he's experienced, done a lot, and he's had a very good experience with uh, complete side of reductive surgery in HIPAC. He attends regular conferences and trains residents uh, and fellows. He knows how to 
you know, bring other people on board and to, and to, and to bring in new information to kind of benefit the patients that he sees and, and does on a, on a regular basis. And then he has me, the pelvic relief surgeon. I'm kind of like the middle reliever, okay? And so unlike baseball, once you come out, you can't go back in again, all right? So the dragon works through the seventh inning. He has me come in around the seventh inning stretch, all right? I do a couple, you know, resections in the pelvic area on both men and women, because, you know, when you look at it, you know, that's really where, as a G1 oncologist, I train mostly in the pelvis. I do do a little of upper abdominal uh, dissections. Where vice versa, you know, surgical oncologists are basically from the hemipelvis up, right through the diaphragm, and they do a little bit in the pelvis. So we switch roles a little bit. I do a lot of the peritoneal dissections and kind of, uh, you know, remove some of the tumor. It gives him an opportunity to have an hour, hour and a half break, and gives the OR staff the opportunity to have a little bit of comic relief when I come in. Right? And like I said, I have a different skill set, and I think it really benefits when you have a 10 to 14 hour kind of length of case. So do you have any questions at all about that, about building a team? I think he's been really successful at it. It's definitely a model that's not the same. Like I worked at UPMC, where they, the surgical oncologists do it the entire time. It's definitely a different model than what we've expected and experienced there. But it's definitely been a very successful one, and we have had very good patient outcomes here. Questions? No? All right, thank you.